Good evening, everyone. Welcome to National Science Week. For some of us, every week is Science Week, and for some of us, one week out of the year might be Science Week, and this is the week. Uh, my name is Mark Quigley. I'm an associate professor in the School of Earth Sciences. Uh, this is my friend and colleague, Jeremy Silver, who uh, is also in the School of Earth Sciences. We are very different types of scientists. We're going to be sharing uh, the products of our collaboration with you tonight. Uh, and it's been very fruitful and really challenging and really interesting. I've really enjoyed working with you on it, Jeremy. And so uh, we're very delighted to be able to bring that to you guys all tonight. So thanks very much. And um, yeah, I'm going to speak for the first 20 minutes, half hour or something. And Jeremy's going to come and tag me off and, and, and finish things up. So you're here because you're interested in science communication, I presume. And these are really interesting and challenging times for us, aren't they? Because so many of the problems that we face as a society are becoming less about science and more about how science interfaces with policy or how uh, science plays out in the decision-making space. And a lot of those things actually have their roots, arguably, in the communication of science. So how we as scientists communicate to the general public how we communicate to decision makers, whether they use that or, or not, and so on. And so for a long period of time, we've really been trying to tell our scientists we need to become better communicators, whatever that is. We need to tell stories. We need to um, engage. We need to do these things. And these things, a lot of these terms are great, and they're true, but there's a lot of a, a, there's a, an emotional element to a lot of them. And so what we're trying to do tonight is to tell you a little bit about how we objectively analyze elements of science communication. How do we look at these communication problems in a very, very scientific way, with data uh, in a sort of a dispassionate view? And uh, we've made some really important observations in the last few years, and that's what I'm going to share with you tonight. So I hope you, I hope you enjoy that. Before we get too carried away with science communication, though, we need to set some framework for what, how the process works and what we actually do. So you may be a scientist, or you may be a scientist, a scientific communicator. So you may have a real interest in science. Maybe you're not quite a scientist, but you love to communicate about science. Uh, or you may be both. And one group of an audience that you might communicate to are your, your peers, other types of scientists in your field. Uh, you may communicate to the general public. I stole this image of, from one of Jeremy's uh, recent lectures. You can say he's a very popular guy in the sphere. You may communicate to the, to, the, to the hordes in a variety of different ways. And you may communicate to decision makers. And so this is a very highly idealized space because, of course, we as people may belong to all these camps. We might be scientists or not. We are at times the general public having questions about a scientific issue that we may or may not know much about and making decisions all the time. Um, things like vaccinations, things like should we wear a bike helmet, these sort of things can be informed by science. Our views might be colored by a whole bunch of things. Uh, we may sometimes make bad decisions or good ones. Uh, the whole process is so complicated, it's so hard to objectify, it's so hard to get your hands around uh, because sometimes we offer science unsolicited to people. Sometimes it's actually asked from us. We might be asked by the, the Turnbull government, for example, to provide scientific ex expertise on an issue. Or they might ask someone else who doesn't necessarily know as much about the issue as you, they, you feel that you know. So how do you get your space into there? It's quite hard. Sometimes we're asked directly. Sometimes the process is quite hierarchical. Uh, as in, someone over here wants to know, but it's going to go through this communication pathway before the science actually gets there. It might also be quite indirect. Uh, this person wants to know, and so you have to communicate to that person to let that person know. Uh, in terms of scientists, we may play a whole bunch of roles. We might be pure science providers. There are some purists of us. We, we don't want to be involved in a decision making. We don't want to advocate. We just want to provide you with scientific information. Okay, And that's a lot of scientists are quite comfortable with that role. We might be an arbiter. We might be asked to try to arbitrate the two very uh, different uh, uh, scientific concepts to kind of help decision makers choose one option or another. We may advocate for science in general, as in this issue, should definitely be informed by science. 
or a specific science pathway. Or we might be a knowledge broker. So we might, for example, say to decision makers, well, here are the myriad ways that science might contribute to the issues that you're trying to address. Uh, and so the sphere is complicated. It goes everywhere and it's, it's hard to objectify. In the highly complex environment of science communication, the public and decision maker, what approaches are most effective? Uh, this is really hard. Sometimes something works and you do the exact same thing the next time and you get nowhere. So we want to try to measure effectiveness and we want to think about things like what we do if they don't listen. And they could be anyone, the public, uh, decision makers, a whole variety of people. And when we look at this image here of these iconic humans that we have dealt with over, not directly for most of us, over our, our lives, uh, they evoke feelings of emotion in us. We look at a face, we feel a certain way, and we, if we are scientists, we might have a perception of how that individual views, values, understands science or not. And so one of the things I want to try to play a game with you guys just to start here to sort of characterize just how hard it is to remove our bias. In order to evaluate this process, we need to remove our emotional bias from the way that we assess decision makers, in this case, uh, national level leaders, how they use science and how they advocate for science. So I've got a series of quotes here, okay? This is a fun little game for us to play to warm our brains up on this cold evening. And I want you to read the quote and I want you to tell me who you think the president or prime minister this quote refers to in the quote, okay? And because it's so nice, even at our mature age, to be read to, I'm going to read these to you as well, okay? So the first one. When the department was ready to make a recommendation whether the nation should move ahead to develop an open A site for the storage of nuclear waste, they prepared some materials. I reviewed it with my office, we sat with other relevant offices, and then we sat with the Prime Minister or President, gave them the range of options, and they made the decision at the meeting. Who does that refer to? Who is the President or Prime Minister that's being discussed there? Does anybody have an idea? This is the audience participation part. You must have some feeling of emotion to, for what, towards one of these candidates on there. Not Rudd. Not Rudd? Okay, that's good. We can play that game too. We can cut people out. <laughs> okay, this, this, this refers to George W. Bush. This uh, handsome fellow right here. And it, it refers to the storage of nuclear waste at the Yucca Mountain site in Nevada. Here's another one. After the recent tsunami, the PM president was interested in tsunamis and how they worked and what caused them. And what a warning system would look like in preparation for a decision that they made about how we should participate in the international response to that disaster. Who might this statement refer to? This is a president that's interested in tsunamis, what caused them, interested in warning systems. What's your emotion telling you? Obama. Anyone else? A few nods of approval. Because he's a trustworthy guy and he likes science. Actually, this is also George W. Bush. The villain of science. And this one. The Prime Minister President today signed into a law a very expensive spending package that rejects deep cuts to research agencies. In many cases, provides substantial increases and results in the largest federal research spending increase in a decade. So for those of us who are scientists, these are the glory days. Too much money, we don't know what to do with it. Who does this refer to? The biggest villain of all? I think I heard it. Do you know? This is uh, Donald J. Trump signed into law. In fact, uh, US uh, funding of science, government funding of science, is at the highest level it has, it has ever been. And this one. The government has decided to terminate the carbon tax to help cost of living pressures for families and to reduce costs for small businesses. <laughs> Who's this one? Abbott. This is Rudd. This is Rudd. 
So I guess what I'm trying to get at here, if you haven't got it already, is that there are things happening out there that we have an emotional response to. We might think that this certain leader values or doesn't value science, um, but then there are, is conflicting evidence towards some of these, these things. Now, one of the most important things that we have to realize is that science is not the be-all, end-all of all of Earth's problems. Science is but a small patch in the tapestry of what we might consider to be necessary and expedient considerations of our leaders. And so what this Afghan rug up on the screen is trying to show you is some analysis that I've done with Jeremy where we have counted keywords in every State of the Union address of every US president from Truman to Trump, not manually, we, Jeremy wrote a code, I was doing it manually, he said don't do that. Uh, for the keywords that are listed down the side here. And then what we're showing here is a percentage of those keywords. We might have first order science keywords and second order words that might or might not relate to science given the context and other ones that are less related. Through time, every year, since 1947 to 2018. And what this data allows you to do is to think about position yourself as a decision maker on the national scale. If you were involved in several international wars and you had uh, an uh, economic crash, a housing market crash, you would be crazy to go up there and at your State of the Union talk about how wonderful science and technology was and how it was going to save the day. Uh, but there is a window, there's an opportunity and there is choice. And so what the black line here is showing is the relative percentage of usage of these different science keywords throughout all these different presidents as they go back through time. And typically they might add up, although the, 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 the variations between technology, space, research, science might add up to between 10 to 20 percent of those total keyword usages. It is but a small patch. Uh, and so I think that's really quite important for us to, to realize. In the highly complex environment of science that communicates to, to, to public and decision makers, what approaches are most effective and how we measure effectiveness? And what do we do if they don't listen? So for those of us who are scientists, we've been operating in our main communication vehicle for a very, very long time. In fact, I looked this up. We've been operating in this way since 1665, which is the, the, uh, the first scientific journal, Philosophical Transactions. Um, and basically the process of writing, doing science, writing a research paper, having it undergo peer review, and ultimately publishing a paper that, of course, everybody in the world is going to read and cite, but uh, so very, very few actually do. Uh, and with the number of, with the population growth and with the number of scientists uh, increasing and increasing and increasing, we uh, are increasing the amount of publications that we publish every single year, the number of research articles to extraordinary amounts. So this is basically publications per year. Um, and it's, uh, we, we're across over a million publications per year in the 90s, early 90s. And that rise is continuing and continuing. And in 2016, there were 2.2 million scientific articles published around the globe. Uh, and that's, yes, continuing uh, to increase. We hit 50 million articles in, in existence. And so I guess the question could be, what on earth, how do we distill this? What can we possibly do to draw meaningful things out of this gigantic volume and translate it to the, to the, uh, the people that matter? Um, we've been blessed with a whole bunch of advantages, things that we have been able to use to help us cope with this giant volume. So the science of everything is available on Google Scholar now. Um, and, but if I tell this to my students when they're writing their research papers, if you haven't looked at Google Scholar in the last 10 minutes, you're probably out of, out of date. Editors of major journals have got all this smart, it's not actually that smart, but it thinks it's smart, editorial software to help us deal with giant volumes of, of literature and to get it into peer review. And there's a lot of discussion of providing open access to, to science. If the public is funding it, surely they deserve to re read the research papers without paying 20 or $30 per um, per article, but a lot of the cost now is obviously being passed back on to the scientific community to, to pay for the open access rather than the journals themselves. The bottom line is that most of these people 
the people at Jeremy's lecture, the decision makers that don't read scientific papers, no matter how many papers exist or how accessible they are. So we've developed a variety of strategies to deal with that. We might have a science festival that is attended largely by people who are already interested in science. And so that doesn't always work as well as it might. We publish articles on the conversation to be read by other people who are already interested in science and hopefully picked up by newspapers uh, that reach an audience that may not be interested in science, although that doesn't happen perhaps as often as we might like. We're asked to provide expert advice and things like uh, IPCC reports where we have specific sections that might be designed to be read by policymakers. We may undertake highly specialized contract type work um, and we have so many science media training courses and all this stuff is really, is really, really great. Um, but the bottom line is that when we provide science to decision makers, uh, it is so intermingled, intermingled with politics and values. It's influenced by the socioeconomic times. There's plenty of anecdotes where uh, decision makers have been provided with science but have just simply opted for another decision that is not aligned with the prevailing scientific evidence for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, the delivery is challenging, it's hierarchical, it's often fortuitous. I just happened to bump into the Prime Minister uh, walking down the hallway and he asked me to provide some science. Uh, the utility in decision making is often unclear. So we've come up with a whole bunch of things. We've basically tried to take this whole incredibly complex process and define a list of things that scientists might do in their day-to-day jobs, for example, we might analyze pre-existing data or acquire new data. Um, we might characterize risks. We might characterize scientific uncertainties and so on. We've documented all these kinds of things. We have this whole list of science actions about things that scientists might do to actually communicate to decision makers. Sometimes not so well and sometimes very well. So for example, we might try to define who the decision makers are and what they need, and what their goals are, before we write our article, before we even do our science. We might assist them with providing, uh, with, with identifying relevant science. We might do a whole bunch of things. Um, act as peer review of other people's science, assist them to understand the limitations of science, and so on. And then finally, the last wordy, text-worthy slide uh, for the little while, is we might do a whole bunch of other things uh, in, to try to enhance how science is provided and used by decision makers. And this is something as a community we don't actually do all that well. Don't worry about taking photos of this. I can send you, I can send you a copy if you email me. Um, the whole bunch of things that we don't do as well. So do we, for instance, after we've delivered the science, do we check up, do we offer new potential uh, avenues for more science to be used? Do we try to maintain those relationships, build new ones? Um, do we document the process by which we provided science to someone through some communication method. Ultimately, that made its way through the food chain. How did it influence the ultimate outcome at the end? And so what the aim of this very painful uh, but also somewhat pleasurable uh, job was, was we've identified a whole bunch of case studies. For instance, po instance, pollution delivery to the Great Barrier Reef, characterizing life safety risks after earthquakes, uh, understanding different agricultural pesticides use and the, and the influence on agriculture, we've identified the actions that scientists used and the pathways that they used and whether ultimately the decisions that were made were aligned with the science evidence or not. Very, very hard thing to do, but we've tried. And so this plot basically shows on the x-axis here, this is the percentage of what we know is a potentially relevant and available scientific research that was used as a function of the scientific agreement amongst, amongst those inputs. A lot of things plot up in here, but what you'll notice here is that sometimes the decisions aligned with some scientific evidence, sometimes they aligned with a lot of it, and sometimes they didn't align, align with the prevailing scientific evidence. So it's about measuring effectiveness. It's about understanding complexity and about how understanding how science resides in the political world. And this is one of my favorite graphs. This is a graph of John Key's political popularity, the New Zealand ex-Prime Minister, um, popularity over time. And this was a really, really challenging time for New Zealand, but uh, a time of really, really good GDP growth uh, and the challenges of the Canterbury earthquakes, which I was a part of in, in Christchurch. 
And what you, what you can notice here is that when people did polls about John Key's popularity, oh, he performed very well in managing the, the, uh, the New Zealand economy very, very well in the recovery from the Christchurch earthquakes. But he did a crap job at managing the housing prices in Auckland. And as a result, his political popularity declined, just like the increase in Auckland housing prices, uh, as opposed to all the other wonderful things that he did while he was the Prime Minister. So how does it fit in the world? One of the things that we're really interested in as well is trying to quantify whether we have built trusted sources for science or not, whether we have sustained public interest in science over time, and basically how long the public stays interested in static scientific content. So for example, you put something out there in the sphere, you leave it there, how long does the public actually care about the science that you've presented? This graph shows something really interesting. This is uh, web, monthly website uh, traffic to science, earthquake science websites before and after the major 2010 earthquake in Christchurch. And these numbers here show the amount of increase in traffic as a result uh, at, at science websites that actually responded to that event uh, and how that declined through time compared to websites that didn't. And so the bottom one there, the websites that didn't respond, the traffic stayed relatively flat. The websites that did had massive increases in user traffic from the, the community, wanting to better understand earthquakes, the science of earthquakes, how frequently they might occur, and so on. But the coolest thing about this is that years after the earthquakes, the traffic remained really high at sustained level. So in a way, we've been able to capture something. We have the pre-stimulus traffic, we have the response, and then we have this really, really slow decay. And so this gives us a really neat example of how we have built a trusted source that's been sustained through time. These are other examples of it. This, this shows traffic at Geonet, Geonet, which is an earthquake website, um, traffic at my website, which was an earthquake website, and the earthquakes themselves the actual occurrences of earthquakes. And with time, we noticed that there was a divergence, that people stayed interested in the science of earthquakes even a bit longer than the decay of the earthquakes themselves. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail. I don't have enough time to get too stuck into that. But that's the gist of that slide there. And then finally, this last question. How long does the public stay interested in static content? What we've done is we've taken articles, scientific articles published on the conversation. We've looked at their daily traffic to those sites um, in days since the event. And uh, we actually are able to say that probably within one to four days, uh, half as many people are interested in your content as they were on the first day that it was released. So the half-life, if you will, of science communications that are static is probably about one to four days. Uh, there's, of course, resurgences that might be stimulated by a whole variety of things, but that's something that we need to think about. Okay, in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, some science I've been involved in and some really, really key elements of communications of science. One is uh, the, the earthquake response and recovery from the Christchurch earthquakes. Uh, I had a major role there. I was a local resident. In fact, I used to live just over in this area here throughout that whole sequence, and so um, was quite involved in a variety of ways. And the other one is this uh, really interesting stage we're at in Australia at the moment, where there's a major critical infrastructure development going on, Snowy 2.0, storage of nuclear waste, aging dams, et cetera, et cetera. And earthquake science has a role to play in that as well, and so we're going to look at that very briefly. Uh, this is an example of an earthquake surface rupture, and so immediately after this, where all the people in this part of New Zealand moved closer to Christchurch and everyone else here moved closer to Sydney, there were a whole bunch of science communication activities that we undertook. We told farmers why the uh, rivers were now flowing through the middle of the paddocks when they never had before. It's because the land had been displaced and re-diverted the rivers. Uh, we provided people with reasons for why the roads were ruptured the way they were and why they were ruptured where they were uh, to perhaps advise them on how they might be repaired. We provide, provided advice to people living in earthquake damaged homes about things like aftershocks and continued creep on the fault um, and advise them to evacuate their homes uh, and also perhaps not to rebuild right on top of the fault. 
Uh, we used a whole bunch of really sophisticated, expensive technology, and it was all really wonderful and incredibly pleasurable, and um, we learned a lot. For example, the last major earthquake on this fault was 20,000 years ago. But the reality, and we have to be very, very honest about it, the reality of this is that life was moving on much faster than science could ever do. We could not keep up with the decisions that were being made. So the decision tree, look, for example, for a new house, looks something like this. Is the fault zone active? Yes. What's the recurrence interval of, of earthquakes on that fault zone? It's greater than 3,000 years, 3,500 years. Is the zone discrete, as in can we see the individual traces or not? Yes, we can. Um, okay, well, well, we'll issue a construction permit because the recurrence interval is so long that in the lifetime of that house, it's very unlikely that they'll get another event. The reality is, of course, that the houses, once we went through this process, were already rebuilt right on top of the fault scar because the insurance companies were very happy to just go ahead and have a punt. The roads were repaired immediately with gravel because they didn't need science advice to repair the roads, they just repaired the roads. Uh, flood levees were, were constructed because farmers didn't want rivers flowing through the paddocks. They didn't care so much about what we thought about how much displacement of their land there had been, they just didn't want the river in their paddocks. And there was this real need for expediency that outpaced science capacity. It's quite common and a real challenge that we often deal with. I see some nodding heads, so obviously you've been there um, too, some of you. A very, very different type of risk. The strong ground shake in the earthquakes caused fatal rock falls throughout Christchurch. Here's some examples of before and afters. Before, after. Uh, lots of houses, including new developments going on right there. Before, a crack in the landscape. After, the, cl the collapse of that cliff. Houses collapsing on cliff cliffs uh, at the top and rock fall rubble burying cliffs. And boulders traveling many, many hundreds of meters. In this case, this football shaped boulder here going right through the middle of a house. Uh, having come from a cliff way up the source. Science underpinned so much of this. There was something called the risk equation. And the risk equation was the risk of dying from rockfall is the uh, product of the annual probability of a rockfall event occurring, the probability of you being present in the path of a boulder, the probability that if you are present when the event occurs, that you're present when the event occurs, and the probability of you being killed if you're present. And actually, given the look of that boulder, I would imagine you'd think of that as quite high. So this was put in, science informed all of this, uh, and these contours were drawn around the area to basically assess people's uh, chances of dying from future rockfall events. As good geologists, we went out and mapped thousands of boulders. We were interested in comparing the ones that fell down in 2011 in the earthquakes with ones that had fallen down before in the distant past at time X. And one of the first things we noticed is that the ones, the red ones here, the modern ones, seem to have gone a lot further than any rockfall in the past. It was a bit of an interesting puzzle. If we had used the distribution of past rockfalls to make decisions about where people could live, it would have been sweet. It was fine. No, rock, no rocks had traveled that, f that far. We used a variety of different techniques to understand when the last fall, rockfall event occurred. These are individual ages and a, and a cumulative prob probability uh, distribution function. And it turns out that actually when we dated sediment built up behind the rocks and underneath and used these sort of things, that the last major rockfall event in this area was five to 7,000 years ago, which is quite a long time. Um, and so uh, we were able to provide that information. We compared the sizes of rocks and how far they traveled. They were about the same frequency volume distributions and so on, but they ran a lot further. Um, and then we got thinking about well, what's changed since then? Well, what's changed since then is that the whole landscape has been deforested. So the rock falls we were seeing from five to 7,000 years ago occurred when there was native, dense native forest in that landscape. The forest is no longer there. It's been deforested, and so with less things for rocks to hit on their way down the slope, the rocks travel further, and they make it into, this is some numerical modeling of that, make it into population centers when they might not have. Now, why would this be interested in a decision-making space? Well, it has the ability to inform risk. The idea being that if we could somehow revegetate those landscapes with native vegetation, give it enough time to mature, that we might actually be able to reduce the, the rockfall um, the rockfall run out distances. 
While all this was going on, there was, a, there was some hearings going on about individual properties, people appealing their decisions, and so on. And so we had this really interesting science, but we just didn't have an audience. We didn't really know what to do. And we made approaches to the city council, and they sort of expressed some interest, but nothing really happened. Some of you might be experienced this sort of thing. So we tried something called media leveraging, which is just a fancy way of saying, we talked to the press, we told them what we did, and we saw what happened. And what happened was they published a big story that got everyone up in a hoo-ha uh, with a terrible headline that actually didn't really have much to do with what we were talking about, but that's okay. Uh, the science became publicly available, and individual property owners that were affected by the, the outcomes of the decision making were reading about the science, some of the science that maybe could contribute, but that was not. And so we actually were invited to participate in courtroom hearings to present our science, submit our papers as evidence, and it reached decision makers through that process. So the Rockfall tree, the, the decision making tree was like, did Rockfalls occur? Is future activity likely? Uh, does future Rockfall pose a risk to life? And so on. And our research papers were able to contribute to various places in the decision tree, which was quite interesting. Ultimately, the decisions were scientifically informed. They were precautionary, as in they largely didn't want people living in those areas. But there was adaptive capacity. The decisions could be tweaked for individual properties depending on different solutions that might be used. The final slide that I've got for you tonight is something about critical infrastructure. Uh, Australia has all these old dams that sit on top, top of active faults. The faults generate magnitude 7 earthquakes every 30 to 100,000 years. And we've just been able to start using this technology to identify, this is, this is um, LIDAR, these are laser scans of the ground surface, to identify things like these, which are evidence of active faults going through that landscape. We trench the faults, we understand, we map the sediments, and we understand roughly when the last earthquakes occurred and what their recurrence intervals are. And we're in the middle of this grand experiment because at the moment we've given all this information to decision makers and we don't know what the hell they're going to do with it. And so I guess the main point of this is the science doesn't stop there. In fact, in a lot of ways the science is just beginning. We need to document the process. We need to be as honest as possible about the uncertainties and the information we provided and hopefully make some, um, make some progress in understanding how science and the communication of science influences decision making. I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy right now and maybe see you again very shortly. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. So um, Aristotle said, nature abhors a vacuum. And indeed, science doesn't live in a vacuum. It swims in the abundance of ideas and ideology um, that, uh, of, of our modern society. Um, modern scientists are encouraged to, uh, to, to adopt a public face, uh, to spruik their findings um, to the media and to the general public. Um, some of these results do get adopted by, uh, by journalists, lobbyists, and even politicians. Uh, people with, with much, uh, a much louder platform uh, than the everyday science practitioner. And what more influential voice can we think of than uh, the President of the United States? Um, how much does the President speak about science or science-related themes? Um, so um, Mark and I uh, turned some of our standard analytical tools um, to look at a very different uh, issue to what we normally work on. Um, so we went back uh, at and, and um, analysed um, uh, two types of uh, messages given by given annually by the U.S. President, um, the State of the Union address, uh, which is uh, a speech given to the joint houses of Congress, and the President's bu budget message, um, which is uh, presented in a written format. So the State of the Union address uh, is d um, is watched by millions of people, whereas. Uh, it, the, the budget message is really directed to uh, lawmakers. Um, so we looked at um, what was said by 13 presidents from Truman to Trump uh, going back to 1950, um, seven Republicans and six Democrats, and we uh, looked at a whole range of different um, keywords um, from some which were very uh, closely 
uh, allied to, to science, um, those uh, which were less so, and um, a whole range of economic, military, and, and other themes. And we looked at what patterns emerged. So how did this work? Well, we took the, the text uh, of the speech, which are available uh, online uh, at a website from University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, we searched for uh, keywords. So here we've got um, uh, extracts from uh, speeches by Kennedy, um, George W. Bush, and Obama, um, talking about uh, econo economy, uh, employment, and, uh, uh, and terrorism, uh, amongst other things. And then we boiled this down to the number of times they, they mentioned specific themes. So we can look at this um, in a range of different ways. Um, we can see how, how the, the keyword usage uh, evolved over time. Um, in particular, we see that um, economic themes, so we've got economy in black um, and business in this pink shade and jobs in sort of this gray green and employment um, in maroon, they're, they're the most commonly used themes. And down the bottom, uh, we've got uh, space, science, research, uh, technology. Um, Mark uh, had these uh, in, in, a, in a similar figure uh, pre uh, earlier. Um, and we can see uh, some things, when we start to look at this, some things uh, start to jump out at this. And um, this is probably just because I haven't um, studied a great deal of American history, but I was surprised to see, now we can see that uh, environment is given in this sort of pink shade. I was surprised to see just how much uh, Nixon and, and George H.W. Uh, Bush talked about the environment. But, so one thing that we've done here is um, uh, that we've looked at the keyword counts and how they've evolved over time, but we can look at how they relate, how they're used together. Um, in the same speech. And we can see that um, uh, looking at these correlations, uh, we can see that um, science, research, technology, these correlate uh, very strongly with one another, um, as does uh, uh, jobs and business. Interestingly, um, uh, defense and business uh, are strongly negatively correlated. And when we uh, look at the, the budget messages, we find, um, yes, there's a strong correlation between um, the science themes, but also negative correlations between um, military and, and economic themes. So in this uh, presentation of the result uh, of, of, these, of these data, um, we've, got, we've imposed an order. We've got our... our our favored, uh, or the keywords of interest uh, right here on the left. Um, but what if we drop this ordering? What if we say, okay, let's throw out the ordering and um, see what order emerges? So we've done this using um, uh, agglomerative clustering. Um, and unsurprisingly, we see that science uh, clusters together with research, technology, and space in the State of the Union addresses. but um, for the budget message, um, science clusters with, not, uh, with technology as well as business. Um, tax and economy uh, are very closely linked, as are many of the um, military themes. And again, some interesting uh, things come through. So if you look at what clusters with environment, um, so in the State of the Union, uh, it's, it's actually drugs. Um, or in the, the budget messages, it's crime. Um, so why, why does this happen? Well, it turns out that these are particular themes that uh, some uh, presidents have talked a lot about. Um, and these were, in, in, in these cases, um, let me see. Okay, I've I think I've lost my place in my notes. Sorry. 
Okay, the, these were these the, the these pairs of um, themes were were t particularly favoured by Nixon and Clinton. Okay, so we can uh, uh, take the same approach and look at um, how similar uh, in in content uh, the messages of the different presidents were. And again, we'll look at the the correlations first. And so uh, they're ordered chronologically from Truman through to Trump. Um, and so the, they're, they're perfectly correlated with themselves, that's the diagonal. If you look at the off diagonal, they're actually quite strongly correlated with their immediate successor. Um, and, um, sorry, uh, there are some correlations along party lines. Um, Obama and, and Clinton uh, uh, show strong correlations. Um, and if we look at the, what, what's happening in the budget messages, there's a, um, a strong block of correlation that runs from uh, uh, President Kennedy through to um, Reagan or Carter, depending on how, how you look at it. And this kind of breaks down afterwards. Um, you can see that uh, the most recent office bearer, Trump, is, uh, shows some of the lowest correlations to uh, the previous uh, presidents in, in, the, in this analysis. And when we look at the, uh, the clustering, um, this, uh, th this is also reflected. Um, uh, but in the budget messaging, uh, the budget messages, uh, Trump clusters closely to uh, George W. Bush, at least in the prosecution of his economic messages. So we can, uh, we can play this game again, uh, looking at both the correlations and the clustering, um, and we can see how, d how do the um, presidents uh, correlate with their, with their favorite keywords, and we can see uh, some patterns emerging that we may recognize. George W. Bush talked a lot about terror. Uh, Reagan talked a lot about um, space, God, and tax, and Ford talked a lot about energy. So uh, this is all very well and good, but uh, we can look a little bit further into extracting uh, a signal from the noise. And one way of doing this is something called principal component analysis. Uh, it's just one way of reducing the complexity of a data set. Instead of using the original variables in the data set, uh, we will rescale the data to create new variables, which individually explain the maximum amount of variation in the original data set. Um, so this is illustrated on the left. So we've got a three uh, points in a three-dimensional space, x, y, and z. These are our original variables. And we can see that they mostly fall along this two-dimensional plane. And so we'll create new variables, uh, which we'll call principal components, that um, run along and across the plane, and they describe most of the variation in this data set. So we're applying this here. Um, uh, we've actually got quite a lot going on in a single graph. So um, let's try and break it down a bit. Um, on each of the panels, um, we've got uh, two principal components, one in the horizontal and one in the vertical axis. Um, and we've got two colors here, red and black. The red points, they show what keywords went into making up that particular principal component. And the black text shows the, the strength of that principal component, um, uh, the, sorry, shows the, how each president scored for that principal component. Um, so uh, what, when looking at trying to make sense of these results, um, I, my, my, my interpretation is that the first principal component is showing uh, themes that evolve over time. Um, so uh, things like uh, inflation, housing, uh, were, were very, um, were, these have, these have both decayed in their usage over time. Whereas things like uh, terror um, and 
uh, pollution and climate. Um, these, are, these have all uh, increased in usage over time. So that's kind of how I, I've interpreted the first principal component. Um, and there is some, there's some correspondence between the State of the Union and the budget messages in how this plays out. Um, the second principal component is harder to, uh, harder to, um, uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't reduce as neatly um, for the, across the two messages. But broadly speaking, um, I, I've found that there, there's something, um, there are some themes that, that, that seem to correspond to a liberal conservative divide that don't necessarily um, that align to uh, the Republican Democrat division um, that, that fit into this uh, second principle component. Themes like um, education and research um, are decorrelated with, with tax and religion. And this is something that we see in both, in both of them. Okay, at this, head, at this point, my head is trying to is starting to spin trying to make sense of uh, all of what's going on here. So let's try and let's take a much simpler approach. Uh, so far we've only looked uh, at the State of the Union addresses and the budget messages separately. So why don't we bring them together? So let's plot on the x-axis the number of time, uh, the, the percentage keyword usage uh, in, the pal in the President's budget messages versus uh, the State of the Union, um, the number of times, um, uh, sorry, the keyword percentage usage uh, for a given speech, for a given president, um, um, in the y-axis. And we can kind of make a, um, and so we've got on the left-hand side uh, four different themes, very closely allied to science, and then four more themes which are more distantly uh, related to, to science. Um, um, and we can see that we're kind of breaking up uh, this space into four groups. And this is very loose groupings. We've got um, tho those uh, presidents who are not advocating for science, those who are, I think this should be yes. the public perception advocates up here, and these should this should be the funding uh, advocates, and these are the um, consistent advocates. Um, and where you want to draw the border is, 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 is a bit subjective, uh, but we can see that um, there, there are people who are, who are really speaking to Congress about, about science, but they're not speaking to the public. Um, and uh, again, there are some surprises. When, when I look at this, uh, I was surprised at just how much uh, George H. W. Bush and George W. Bush um, were, okay, this should be uh, funding advocates. So they, they were not necessarily speaking uh, to the public about um, uh, pushing the case for science, but they were, they were actually making the case behind closed doors. Um, so that's, uh, all about all I have for you, and there's a lot more to be said about this, but I'm sort of setting the punchline for Mark. Well, thank you. Even with that spicy little um, changing of the labels, you did very well, the little trick that I put in there for you. So the, fi the final thing that I want to, Jeremy's been very kind to leave me with the, the end here, and this is probably one of the craziest things that we've tried to do. We don't know if it's going to work yet. I'm sure there'll be people lined up to tell us whether it does or it doesn't. What we've done here is we've looked at the Gallup poll approval rating for presidents from uh, Truman to Trump. You know, these are how popular the presidents are at various poll, uh, polls throughout their, uh, their, throughout their tenures. There's some surprises there. Um, George W. Bush, for example, uh, after the terrorism attacks, surged to huge <laughs> approval ratings and then also declined incredibly rapidly to one of the lowest. Uh, Donald Trump is one of the, the only, if not the only, president that uh, was less popular when he came into office than his predecessor was when they left, which is interesting. 
Um, but what we've done is we've taken this, which is a metric. These are, these are polls for popularity. And we've also taken uh, the results of a presidential greatness survey where political scientists across the US were asked to give each president a metric for how great they were. We've taken those metrics and we plotted them against science advocacy scores. So basically, these are, this is a metric for how much we think those individual presidents advocated for science, either through their messages, the State of the Unions, and the presidential budget messages, but also the establishment of new scientific uh, bodies, agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency, um, or, or nanotechnology agency, these sorts of things. We've tried to be objective, we've tried to quantify everything, we've tried to put it on a graph, and voila, if we could only convince the next president of the United States that if they advocated for science more, they might ultimately end up with a higher approval rating and ultimately end up to be perceived to be greater uh, when all is said and done leaving behind a legacy that in some very small way was perhaps shaded just, just, just a tiny bit by science. So science res resides within these really complex decision-making frameworks. There's so much to consider. It's very challenging. The volume of potentially relevant science, the mechanism to communicate it are continuously increasing, but this does not ensure increased science utility and decision-making. There are so many avenues for us now to communicate science, but we still have decision makers that don't often understand or use science perhaps as well as they could. There are a whole bunch of ways objectively that we can measure the effectiveness of science communications. There are instances that illustrate the triumph and the shortcomings of science provisions to inform decision making, informed by case studies largely. And there are very subtle provocative and perhaps wrong, but hopefully uh, going in the right direction, indications that the leaders that advocate for science may ultimately be viewed as more politically successful. And I think maybe appealing to that narcissistic element might be the way. Thank you. Come on. Are there any questions for us? It's OK if you don't have any. But surely there must be at least one to break the ice. Yes, thank you. Yes, we would love, would we love to do it? We, it would be a good exercise for one to undertake. <laughs> um, the, the, the keywords themselves would have to be different. I mean, we just don't, as a nation, talk about the uh, security, well, no, security possibly, but some of those other elements, shootings and um, some of the other keywords as much. Uh, but we could still do the exact analysis. Um, the polling data is available in various forms. It's hard to standardize. I, one of, we were talking about this earlier. One of the hardest things is to get, say the State of the Union is something that the president gives every year. It's all around the same sort of format to the same audience. We don't really have that same kind of thing here. Um, and so it's a bit challenging in that regard. Uh, I don't know whether we would see that or not. It completely shocked us when we saw this crude sort of correlation in this instance. Um, it'd be very hard. Do you have anything to add to that, Jeremy? Or? Only uh, that we should remind ourselves that correlation does not mean causation. That's right, exactly. <laughs> yep, good one. Spoken like a true data scientist. Yes? Just, um, when, in your um, case analysis, when you mentioned that political polarization is the most
very noble proposal. <laughs> but um, I think one of the things that we like about this is there is a level of containment within our data. Uh, it's, it could be done, you're right, absolutely, but probably more easily for a specific case study than the media covering the issues by all these presidents. It would be super challenging. Yeah, one of the, and even even within a defined collection of media outlets, perhaps, or something. Yeah, it would be interesting. But. There has actually been quite a lot of um, personal analysis of the media surrounding climate change. Um, the, the, the Australian Institute of Climate Change has done some work on that. Yeah. One more question? In that case, we should let you go home. Enjoy yourselves. Thank you very much. We appreciate your attendance.